<laughs> okay. Well, it is 5.46. Um, welcome to a regularly scheduled meeting. We're starting at 5.45 today. May we have the roll call. Uh, Councilmember Brooks is not here yet, so we'll start with Councilmember Clark. Here. Councilmember Peterson. Here. Vice Mayor Brown. Here. And Mayor Kaiser. Here. And we can go out to public comment. Seeing none. <laughs> We will adjourn for closed session. We'll be back at six. Good evening and welcome to this evening's regularly scheduled city council meeting on November 21st, 2023, 6 p.m. start time. Um, I just wanted to make a quick statement uh, before starting the meeting. Um, we, as a, a council as a whole, we'd like to um, express condolences to the family of Deborah Brown. She's a member of our community who was killed this weekend in a tragic hit and run incident, sadly. Um, I know many people are grieving, as are we, and uh, I just want to say that we share in those emotions. And um, a really huge part of this is that if anybody anywhere has any information uh, regarding this incident that happened on Saturday, um, please reach out to our police department. There is um, also a reward for information right now. Um, so it could be any little clue that could help us. Um, I know we all really want to get to the bottom of it. So. Um, I will call this meeting to order in honor of Deborah Town this evening. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Here. Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brown? Here. And Mayor Kaiser? Here. Would you all please join in the Pledge of Allegiance? All right, thank you. Do we have um, additions or deletions? Staff has one proposed change for this evening. We would like to pull item 8D, and we can take that at the end of the evening. Okay, great. And then that'll take us to presentations. Tonight we have a emergency preparedness presentation by our police department and fire. Good evening. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, and the community. I'm here tonight as your police chief, and also I have Assistant Chief Chad Aiken here to give us a little bit of uh, overview of the preparedness as we approach the winter season and then some of the alert systems that we have in place so we can keep the public um, aware of what's going on and then informed in the, in the event of an emergency. Next slide. <clears throat> so the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight is just the levels of activations during, this, the, during the different emergencies. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the notification systems. There's a zone haven, that was something that was new last year that is a little bit confusing to the public is what that is. And then I'm gonna uh, give you a, a very brief update on what the weather expectations are this year and then open that up for winter preparedness and then any questions that you have. Next slide. So um, emergency response is obviously very, very important for a variety of reasons. Um, we wanna prepare for any potential disasters that are out there. Uh, we wanna be able to respond to different emergencies, where, whether it's a local emergency or a regional emergency. And then the other piece is that it assists with the, the recovery efforts when we do have an, uh, an event. So the stuff that we're looking at is just any extreme weather event, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, fires, local disasters, uh, law enforcement activities and also fire activities. Uh, we operate under the SIMS, which is a standardized emergency management system. Next. And just so you, it's, it's kind of like a, 
it starts basically with the field and then they, it's like an accordion. It can either expand or reduce it depending on the emergency. So everything starts on the local level with the police and fire response. Um, and then once it goes beyond that, then we kind of tap in the city resources. And so that would be something the next level is like local city government. Once it goes out the outside the capacity of our local government, then we tap in the county, which is OR3. Um, so that's Santa Cruz County. Um, and then once it goes beyond that, then we tap into our region two resources, which is the state resources. And if it goes all the way up to like this last winter, we, we had to tap into our federal resources. So it can, like I said, it can go all the way up to the federal government and then all, and then also can, can be just handled here at the local level. Next. Um, so the types of uh, alert systems that we have currently for Capitola, um, because you have your own police department, we have um, the ability to send our officers out. So depending on the nature of the incident, if something, something small, maybe it's impacted just a couple houses or a small neighborhood, um, you'll have the police department to go out there and make those personal contacts. If it's isolated or something that's a planned uh, event or planned evacuation. So we'll either do door to door. We always have our PA system on our vehicles. So we did that during the evacuations last, last year. The other piece is that we have Nixle alerts, and that's something that the public can sign up for, and it's an alert notification on your phone. Um, that's sent by the PD. A lot of times you'll get those alerts if we have a special event that's happening, or if we have an accident that happens, we'll put the information out to the public and just say deter from this area, or there's going to be police activity, or, you know, surfing sand is coming this weekend. We don't use it for something small like that, but if we had the Begonia Festival, not Begonia, the Beach Festival, something like that, that's what we use that for. And then we, the next, the next level up from that is we call it a reverse 911. And so what happens there is if we have an incident at a specific house or on the campus of the school, we can request a geographical bubble. And what happens is Net Netcom, it's our dispatch center, will actually um, be able to contact all the residents and they to reverse 911. So we can have a pre-programmed message that we send out to the public saying shelter in place, evacuate, uh, something's happening. So. Once we put that out, we always will follow that up. If we if it undoes itself, we'll put the same notice out. Um, again, that's just the kind of the smaller smaller scale stuff. Next, um, we obviously use social media for quite a bit of, of of information sharing. So we use Facebook, Instagram, Nextdoor. Um, that's uh, that's handled here within the department, the police department, and then the city. We. We work with the city and the police department. We send those messages out. Uh, the next level up from that is the emergency alert system. So that's the EAS system. And those are for Amber Alerts for missing kids or Silver Alerts for missing elderly adults, emergency alerts. And those go out through, um, we put the request in through, their, through the county and then they send that out depending on how big the, the incident is. Moving to a new thing for Santa Cruz County is called Cruise Aware. Um, Cruise Aware is a part of the OR3, which is our kind of our county resource, and that's something that the public can sign up for, and it's, a, it's really easy to sign up for. They can go on there, and they can kind of select out of the menu if you want a, information on fire, if you want wind, if it's um, tsunami. There's a whole variety of kind of lists, so you can go through there. You can sign up for whatever area that you want, and then you can kind of monitor what's going on there, and they'll give you notifications. And then Zone Haven which is kind of, again, new in the last couple of years. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so again, this is what they use Cruise Aware for, uh, non-emergency. It's kind of the same stuff that we use, kind of our reverse 911 and our Nixel alerts. It's just on a on bigger scale for the county. Um, next, next slide. So Zone Haven. So Zone Haven, the program itself, it's ran by the county, um, but we have access to the information that's being put out there. And so Zone Haven is really designed for an evacuation software. So it was, it was, it was picked up by the county in, in light of all the fires and stuff that was happening. And so next slide. And so what they've done is they, they've broken up our city into these kind of geographical zones. And so that was a little bit of a challenge last year when we were trying to do the notifications because we were limited to the zone. So if you look at kind of each, each little section there has a zone. And so when we tried to, um, like the lower village, which actually includes Depot Hill. When we tried to put that message out, it got sent, you know, evacuation warning, and they're up on the top of the hill. So we kind of had to act on the fly and really get in there and try and get a little more granular on our on our announcements. So we have 
the lower village and that flooding area just sectioned off so we can put those notices out. And again, this is something that the public can sign up for and, and you can zoom out of it and kind of see what other emergencies are going on and it'll tell you what the different status of those different areas are. So it's just good information, uh, power outages, um, any stuff like that. But like I said, it's really designed as more of an evacuation software. So what we do is if we want to evacuate a certain zone, we pull all the data from that and then we can actually go out and just as a unified group, we can go out and still start making those notifications and then we're just depending on where the threat is, we just work one way or the other to just get people to those right areas. Um, in the event that we do evacuations, then we set up our Jade Street Park as evacuation point. Next. Uh, this is just a breakdown, kind of the east side in that lower village area that we that we, uh, we developed. Um, again, there's just, those are the zones um, that are, that were programmed in by the county. Uh, we have the ability to adjust them a little bit, but we try to keep up with the, with the neighborhoods. Next. So that's it with Zone Haven. Uh, I'll give you a quick update on the weather. Um, so every, every indication so far is that they're saying it's gonna be an El Nino year. Um, what that means is that, <laughs> quite honestly, we really don't know. Um, so here's an example of all the different recommendations or the, the, of the weather experts that saying everything's indicating that it's, it's gonna be a strong El Nino. Um, next slide. And this kind of breaks down what the difference is strong, moderate, or weak. And as you can see, the green is the precipitation. And you can see even in the strong, quote, strong El Ninos, there's been times we've had a lot of precipitation, there's times when it's been dry. Same thing with the weak. We've had um, early on, it was very dry. And then 20, 2004, 2005, it was really wet. So <laughs> the bottom line is we really just don't know. Uh, we can expect that we're gonna have an El Nino uh, winter. Uh, we just need to be prepared for it and we'll just kind of see what, see what happens. <clears throat> so just as preparedness, we wanna um, really take a look at our stormwater management, really take care of you and your neighbors, be thinking about you and your neighbors. Uh, the things that we're keeping an eye on, especially when it comes to the upcoming winter, the king tides, because we look at those king tides with if there's rain or swell, um, what Soquel Creek is doing, and we look at those comparisons to look if we're gonna have any, any flooding. Um, just making sure that everyone's aware of uh, the different roads that, and, and the mapping that we have out there. Um, if you have a power backup, that's very, very important. Communications, again, signing up for Cruise Aware, uh, the battery backup, and I think the final one was, oh, or no radio. So just being in tune of what's going on with the, with the radio. Next. Uh, this is the sandbag, lo sandbag location. So we do have sandbags here at, at the police department. Uh, Central Fire has them there on 17th Avenue. They don't have them on Soquel. So they do have uh, bags on 17th Avenue. Um, the bags are here in the front of the police department, sands in the back. Encourage those, especially in the low lying areas to, to make those preparations early. I think, and then that's it for me. Like I said, I'm open for any questions. It was kind of a big highlight of, of overview of what's going on with the upcoming weather, um, what notifications we have. And like I said, I have Assistant Chief um, Aiken here as well, if you have any questions about uh, anything else. Thank you for that. Yeah. We have questions. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. And I wanna shout out to the social media. I know that was something when you came on as chief that that was something you wanted to build on and you guys definitely have. So I follow it and I try to share it and I know the rest of us do too. So that's been super helpful. We have a really good team. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, item four, report on closed session. Good evening, we had a closed session on the item on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. And then item five, additional materials. Staff received one email communication related to item 8F and then staff provided an updated attachment for item 8D. Great, thank you. Take us down to item six. This is oral communications by members of the public. Um, this allows for any comments on consent items or anything that is not agendized on tonight's uh, meeting. You will have a maximum of three minutes to speak. 
there's anybody in house that wishes to speak. Good evening. Thank you for letting me be here. Dear council members, my name is Charlotte. In June of this year, you helped us at Cabrillo Mobile Home Estate to reinstate the rent control at our mobile home park. The property is owned by Riviera Enterprises. Thanks to the rent control, we are still paying $641.76 per month. Mrs. Judith Pappas bought her place June 6, 18, 23, and she lives in number 32. She moved into the park in July and has been paying $1,000 per month for space rent. Mrs. Pappas signed the contract. That's what both realtors told her, the buyer and the seller, told her to, to, to sign. Mrs. Pappas is an older lady, and the Vieras took advantage of her. On Saturday, November 18th, I learned that one of the houses in this park is for sale. I checked the details and noticed the rent for this house is $1,000 per month. This is against the rent stabilization ordinance. The maximum rent the Vieras can raise is 15%. The Vieras may use the higher rent example as justification for higher rent for all residents in the park. Thank you very much. I want to bring this to your attention. Uh, my friend Miriam has something to say, and then Ms. Ling will tell more about house number six. Thank you. Hi. Um, Charlotte is now, she's John Haken's widow, and she's now the president of the HOA, and I'm her vice president. And... Um, this is something that had come up in earlier meetings is what do we do if we we know we don't have contact with every single homeowner in the park and how do we how do we get the message to them that these ordinances are even in place and so when Charlotte saw the place was for sale that's what she realized and then also number 32 so um, one of our we, we're all members now of GSMOL which is the Golden State mobile home league we just have representatives and so our treasure our president of that her name is Lori she reminded us that on the fact sheet on the ordinance fact sheet it says if there's a resident that um, where was it? it says to contact the ordinance administrator if the landlord or park owner is violating the ordinance and who administers the ordinance the capital the community development director so Charlotte wrote a letter, which we're going to edit and send from our HOA to this email address, but it was really important to her to also come here and read the letter to you. That's why we're here. Okay, thank you. Hi. Good evening, Mayor Hi. and Councilman. Um, this is Anne Lam, and she lives in number six. Uh, I'm the realtor, and I help her sell her space. Now it's her turn. Uh, oh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anne Lam, and I live in the, the park number, uh, my, my house on number six. So, uh, you know, um, when the earlier in the, the year, I, I got the, the letter from the landlord. They say they will increase um, my rent to 1000 instead of 640 and then um, because of the, uh, they have a meeting in May, but I I have to travel out of the state, so I meet her, meet the landlord. It's early than the May, so um, they give me a new contract and say uh, I have to sign a new contract. And I ask them, um, is the property have let the rent control? And they say they. They answer, they say, because the property is uh, private, so they don't have the rent control. So I need to sign a new contract. If not, I need to move out. So that's why I have no choice to negotiate the lease. So I, I signed the contract. Since, uh, so I been paid for 1000 since June 1st until now. That's my story. 
Thank you. All right, three minutes. Hi, my name is Megan Carroll. I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. I have been at the shelter for two years. I'm here because you have a representative appointed to our Animal Services JPA board, Police Chief Daly, which who I think is, hi. Uh, <laughs> you may have recently read in local media that the shelter has been experiencing a lot of problems and issues. Our three main problems are understaffing, lack of resources, and a management vacuum that we've been dealing with. In the last year, we've had a 22% increase in animals, and it is the highest rate of animals in 10 years, according to our shelter manager, Amber Rowland, today on the radio. She said that. Um, this affects our community because we at the shelter would like to give as much care and uh, as we possibly can to all of the animals and the public who visit our shelter. In the future, these problems will compound and create larger issues that can affect public health, public safety, and also affect own family pets. We ask that you check in with your representative to our JPA board, Chief Daly, as to what is going on at the shelter, the different issues that we're facing, and how that may affect the public. Um, many people in our community are supportive of our shelter and love our local shelter. We bring this to your attention because we want to ensure that the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter can continue to support our community and animals at a high level in the future, and that takes some of us calling um, up for our representatives to check in with the JPA and see what's going on. So I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Sally and I am the director of the Cabrillo College Stroke and Disability Learning Centre. I appreciate the opportunity to come and express my gratitude to the City of Capitola for the support of our centre through the Community Grant Program. Your funding is a significant piece in sustaining our services, especially in what is a rebuilding season for us, following the impacts of COVID, inflation and funding cuts. Your support in keeping this effective safety net service going is greatly appreciated. For those not familiar with our program, we're an education centre for adults managing a change in functioning due to a neurological event. About 50% of our students have had a stroke. Others are managing conditions such as MS, Parkinson's, the impact of cancer or cancer treatments, or they may have experienced a traumatic brain injury from accidents or other events. Our program is all about supporting adults to strengthen the abilities they have to, to participate as fully as they are able in life despite their unexpected functional losses. Our classes support independence, mitigate against continuing decline and celebrate the wisdom and contribution of these adults to our community. We offer classes in mobility, communication and counselling. The classes are led by licensed professionals such as physical therapists, a licensed speech and language pathologist and social workers. However, they're conducted in an educational framework. These adults come as students rather than patients and the collaboration with an understanding peer network creates significant opportunities for mutual support and learning. We also have a range of classes that focus on creative skills. Our students have created wonderful works of art in painting and ceramics, for example, which are shared across campus in the library and gallery and other public art spaces. We have a choir, a joy of music class, therapeutic horticulture class, and each class is a unique opportunity to continue to grow in knowledge and creative expression. In addition to the students who benefit directly from our classes, we collaborate with other Cabrillo departments to provide education and awareness for providing services to people with disabilities. For example, our nursing students complete a rotation through our department and in particular learn how to become a communication partner with people who have experienced a neurological impact on their speech and language. 
It builds their confidence and tools that they need to deliver quality nursing care. The Stroke and Disability Learning Centre supports independence in vulnerable adults in the midst of significant change. Thank you for supporting us as we strive to deliver quality education. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Seeing none, we can take this to any staff comments or council. Uh, thank you. I just wanted uh, to request some follow up on some of the items that came to us um, just now at public comment. So the first, um, if uh, Police Chief Daly could do a follow up uh, at a future council meeting on the activities going on at the Animal Services JPA. Uh, just so that we are kind of have some better insight on what's happening there, um, what our role is as your representative on our board, et cetera, that would be um, great. Uh, and then to follow up on the concerns brought to us from the residents at Cabrillo Mobile Home Estates, um, based on what I remember from the ordinance, I'm pretty sure an increase to $1,000 of the mobile home space is still outside of what the ordinance allows, even when a property is sold. Um, it, that sounds right to me. I don't know. I don't know all of the facts of your situation, but I I would suggest it sounds like um, certainly one of the speakers is on the right track in contacting um, Community Development Director Herlihy. She is the administrator for the ordinance, but I might suggest that the woman who spoke about your rent being increased to $1,000, I might suggest that perhaps you contact Director Hurley here as well, and she can tell you if that increase is consistent with the ordinance. This is, I know, this is a tough week. A lot of people are out, but perhaps on Monday, you and, and you as well, ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't recall your name. You Perhaps you could contact her. We can't go back and forth now, but if, yeah, I think, I think that work. Yeah, that's that's great. I think that's um, just what I was hoping to hear is that we can ensure that staff is following up on this. Thank you. Other comments? I'd like to uh, discuss a few things. Um, one of them being uh, Alexander Peterson, council member, and myself have been working behind the scenes on a project of Hill Street and Bay. And I think it's a good time for us to discuss a little bit about it and um, maybe put it on our next council meeting so that we can bring staff back and, and uh, revisit it. And in the meantime, we are going to have some outreach with the public. Uh, next week, we have a um, meeting planned. Actually, sorry, Joe, are you finished? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, actually, Next week's meeting is not going to be a public outreach meeting. It's a planning meeting. Uh, yes, correct. Internally. Um, and I would propose that we have a special meeting to address the safety issues on Bay next week um, and give the public a chance to talk about their concerns and a chance for staff and ourselves to explain uh, what our process is and what we're planning to do in a timeline of the safety improvements for the Bay Avenue corridor. Yes, I, I think that is a good idea. Although being the holidays, it might be hard for us to get a, a meeting between now and the 14th. But either way, um, have staff come back and, and bring it to us to um, maybe we can move forward a little quicker and just to let the public know that we are working behind the scenes on, the, on this. Yeah, and I'm looking at city, our, our city manager. Generally, we need general consensus, and so I would be in more agreement with Councilmember Clark on bringing it to our December meeting, just so it gives everyone time to prepare on our staff level, and so that council also is all available for that for that meeting. So there's a planning meeting next week. There's an ad hoc committee meeting ad hoc next, committee next meeting. week. Exactly. Yeah. And then staff was planning on reaching out to the adjacent property owners the week before Christmas, somewhere in there, or right after, and then hopefully hosting a community meeting with the residents at 750 Bay, probably the first or second week of January. That's our tentative plan right now. We're happy to bring something back to council if you'd like, a special meeting, or we can do it December 14th. 
So if it came to us on December 14th, there, we could get an update from what happened in the planning meeting? Correct. Yeah, I'd be open to either, but I really want to impress upon the public that we are working on this. It's, it's very important to us. I would love to have the opportunity for um, concerned residents to interact with us before the December 14th, which it seems like a long delay. I'm wondering if we couldn't open up the planning meeting at least to public input as well to sort of have a, at least a sort of temporary round table next week. Would that be possible? I think that it would be a different meeting. Um, you know, the ad hoc committee meeting is, is intended to sort of get some feedback from the council and talk about kind of our outreach plans and refine them. Um, you know, if the council would like us to hold a workshop, we can do that. It's a little odd to do it in this context, I think, right now. Are you suggesting that the public be permitted to provide comment to the ad hoc committee? Yes. Or are you suggesting that the full council attend the ad hoc committee meeting and the public be allowed to provide comment then? The former. Okay. Is that what, I don't know if that's what you understand. So it sounds like we're meeting in the last week of November. Maybe we can have that meeting the first week of December and then have our council meeting the following week. Would that we can do that. I guess I'm I'm just not entirely following what what it is we're trying to do. Um is the idea to have a little bit of a public workshop on this in the interim? We are working on this yeah. soon, my, sooner think, before December 14th. Sure. I think my recommendation would be that we could hold our ad hoc committee meeting and get the feedback from the ad hoc committee and then maybe schedule something the following week um, so that we could do that and then make sure that we're on the same page about what we're showing to the community. So then we could do the, the community, a community meeting the first week in December. As a special city okay, council so meeting? No, I don't think it would need to be a special no. city council meeting, just a meeting for the public to reach out to us mm -hmm. that we can all come back together at, on the 14th for our council meeting. When you say reach out to us, do you mean the ad hoc committee or the full council? Because if it's the full council, it needs to be a council meeting. The ad hoc committee. Okay. The ad hoc committee. Okay. Unless, I mean, I'm, I would be happy for a special meeting too, but it's, I'm sure people's schedules are all over the place. I guess I'm just concerned that if we have a, a special meeting, Yes, we can receive information, but I have no information to give them on what our plans are or what we're doing um, in regards to the Bay Avenue. We haven't received staff information. I mean, and so I think that ultimately the ad hoc committee should get together. I know there's community members who've reached out to me who want to be on it. So I think this that would be their opportunity next week to do that and because that's when the ad hoc committee is. Well, that ad hoc committee next week is not open to the public, which is what I was saying. And then on in December, when we receive that information, it is open to the public. And then we can hear from our community there. I think it's just important for us to have all the information we need. And that's only, what, two weeks, you know, till our December 14th meeting. I think that that's enough time. Well, and can we maybe just recap what we had voted on the last time this was an item. So as a reminder, when when we when the council voted, I think when we presented some different options for Bay Hill Avenue intersection, the council formed an ad hoc committee to assist staff on doing a little bit of outreach and refining the design. The direction was to do that and then reach out to the adjacent landowners and the residents at 750 Bay and then come back with some final plan for council approval. So that's the plan we're working on. Um, I think the goal would be to get something back to the council probably the second meeting in January or the first meeting in February. Um, so those are the steps that are outlined. One option that maybe just makes this a little bit easier is, is we could just open up the ad hoc committee meeting to the public uh, that we, I think, have scheduled. I believe it's next week. Later in the afternoon, we can put out the notice. If anyone's interested, they can attend. We can do it in the community room. And then we can answer questions. Uh, if people do want to attend, that might solve meet meet your interest, Alexander. And uh, I, I would prefer that just to give an opportunity for the community to express um, their concerns.
concerns and each learns about what has happened, um, knowing that we may not have um, complete answers at this time, but that we're working towards that. And then if we'll probably need to have a, an additional private meeting. I would rather have the commu open community meeting sooner and then schedule the additional private meeting the week later, personally. Okay. I'm good with that. Okay, great. Any other council comments? Oh, yeah, I was trying to think of what it was. Um, I received an email from staff about participation in a clean energy program in partnership with the county. Am I saying that correctly? And I was just wondering if staff could give us information on that. Um, we were supposed to sign up clean energy. Oh, I'll look for it. You guys are all looking at me like, is this, I signed up. I get Is it the Resilient Capitola yeah. program? Resilient. Um, resilient Capitola. Oh, it was on social media. Um, so there's a resilient Capitola. It's on social media now live. You can sign your, up your home, your condo, your rental, and it gives you back information on tips and tricks on how to um, lessen your bill and your energy. And then if you sign up, you can come into City Hall and get um, a package of goodies like uh, reusable plastic, non-plastic, whatever, whatever yeah, those wax yeah. papers and such. So anyways, check out our social media, sign up today. Um, we're closed on this Thanksgiving, but come by next week and pick up your stuff. Thank you. Um, just a few announcements for me. Um, this Thursday's Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving, which means on Saturday, the guy in the big red suit surfs into town, right um, out in Capitola, and then um, he will be here for hours speaking to all of the young kids. So please come down. That happens at noon. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So come on down. Check out Surf and Santa. And then the next weekend, December 2nd and 3rd, is the annual cookie walk. So a lot of the businesses in the village will be... Um, handing out cookies for those that would like to participate. Um, and I was lucky enough this past week to do a ride along with Officer Camacho with our Capitola PD. So I just want to do a huge shout out, huge thank you for being gracious and welcoming me, the whole PD and Officer Camacho as well. Thank you so much. And we'll come down to consent. Uh, these items are enacted by in one motion in the form listed below minus 8D, so that would be uh, A, B, C, and then E, F, G, H, and I, unless somebody needs to pull something else. We'll move approval of consent. I'll second it. Great, we have a motion and a second. Do we have a roll call? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. This is unanimously. Thank you. So general government this evening, uh, item 9A, the voting voter polling contract. Uh, the recommended action is to authorize the city manager to execute a professional service agreement with EMC Research in the amount not to exceed $25,000 to conduct polling on potential revenue measures to be placed on the 2024 general election ballot. And here is... Thank you, Mayor Kaiser and Council. As you said, we're going to be speaking about a polling contract. So a little background for you. Uh, in 2021, Council did direct staff to research possible tax measures um, viability in conjunction with the 2024 general election rather than um, placing anything on the 2022 ballot. And more recently, you did allocate funding through the 2023-24 budget goals towards um, to fund a survey of Capitola voters uh, regarding tax measures. So this past fall, I guess we're currently in fall, uh, the Finance Advisory Committee made a formal recommendation to council to, um, if, they, if you are to agree on the polling, to poll around 
two things, the extension of Measure F and a possibility for a general obligation bond. So a little bit more on those two types of possible revenue measures. Uh, extending Measure F you may be more familiar with because this is a current quarter cent sales tax. It was originally passed in 2004. It's been extended twice uh, with generally very high approval uh, in 2008 with 66% approval and more recently in 2016 with 81% voter approval. Um, it currently will expire in 2027 and it does bring in around a million dollars in revenue each year which can um, and could help with ongoing operational expenditures for the city. So keep in mind these two different measures would really meet different needs for the city. A general obligation bond, you'll hear uh, likely the city manager and our finance director say a GO bond, but it's a general obligation bond is what that means. Uh, it is something that would um, put in a property tax. An example, I'm not suggesting this would be the details, but an example is $50 for every $100,000 of assessed value on property within the city. These are um, different in the sense that the revenue would be used for something very specific, projects that often serve the community, and the use of the revenue would be identified in the ballot language. So, for example, this could help with long-term facility needs, infrastructure needs. You'll, you'll see this on ballots often. Um, a geo bond towards building a new police department, for example, or maintaining green space for the community. So, moving on, thank you. Why should we poll? So this is a really good way to determine, I don't want to say if, I want to say how likely Capitola voters are to approve the types of measures the polling um, identifies. This can help determine our community's priorities. Like I mentioned, the language on the ballot includes what the revenue would be for. So if they really want to preserve green space or they really want to rebuild the community center, we would like to know that before we write the ballot language. Also can dive into getting information on what tax amount would voters respond to, how long would they want the tax to be in place, et cetera. So staff did review three proposals from firms that do this sort of research and recommend uh, EMC research. We've gotten really positive feedback on them from neighboring jurisdictions. They would use phone, email, and online surveying, so this is a really more modern approach to survey our um, likely Capitola voters with the hope of collecting at least 200 responses. Remember that we um, are a small community with just under 7,000 registered voters. So that's why that number might seem small, but it's mighty. And uh, we would expect results to be available to be presented to you in the springtime with plenty of time for council to deliberate, listen to res um, those results and determine how to move forward, keeping in mind that the deadline for the ballot is August 9th of 2024. So our recommendation this evening is to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with EMC Research for $22,000 to conduct Capitola polling and um, include questions around these two types of measures in particular, general obligation bond and the extension of Measure F. And I'm available for any questions, and I believe um, a representative from EMC Research is also on the line if you have questions. Thank you. Great. Do we have any questions? I have a quick question. Okay. Are we doing one or the other, or is this for both the bond and the measure? So the, the polling would about both and often how would those two connect um, I have two questions Chloe mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that measure F expires in 2027 mm -hmm. so why would we be pulling for something for 2024 would it go essentially into effect the next election cycle can you just explain that for Absolutely. So I believe, and our city manager can jump in if I'm wrong, that we would want to have that approval ahead of time. So it would just, it would no longer expire in 2027. It would continue through however long we would put on the ballot. And I think that would be something addressed in the polling as well. How much longer would people want? Forever. <laughs> Could we extend it in perpetuity, for example? Okay, thank you. And then my second question is regarding outreach. Can we request that it get be sent out via text as well, not just phone? 
That's a great question, and I don't know. So I can ask, um, certainly. I don't know um, if Jessica is on the line. She, she may have an answer right now for you. Yes, good evening. Um, thanks for letting me jump in. Uh, indeed, our methodology um, would utilize text messaging along with email invitations to complete a survey online, along with telephone calls uh, to both landlines and cell phones. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Jessica, for being here. No problem. Um, I, I think you mentioned this, Chloe, so forgive me if I, if I missed it. So this is polling voters specifically and not just residents, correct? They're going to confirm that these people are registered to vote and will be voting? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Did, did we put this out to bid? We did, and this was the best option. Yes. It was very expensive. This was also the most affordable option. Yeah, because I just wanted to throw it mean, out there. If, if it's asking for uh, people to respond to surveys, could we not just offer people $50 to fill out the survey? Because right now we're paying $100 per survey. So the goal behind these surveys is to get a statistically accurate um, representation of whether or not a measure is going to pass or not. And obviously, if you entice people to pay, you pay people, you're going to get a different sort of group of people responding that isn't necessarily, necessarily statistically relevant. In fact, we don't just, the polls aren't just focused at registered voters, it's actually likely voters. So they can look at the rolls and see who actually has voted in past elections. And then they try to balance it out. You know, you try to make sure that your poll has the right mix of, you know, left and right, different age demographics to try to match what the likely voter profile will be in the election. So there's a fair amount that goes into it and you don't just want to put out a survey monkey because it'll give you different results. I just wanted to ask, I don't know if either you or Jessica, but um, just wondering about availability of uh, bilingual options, if this would be offered in Spanish for those voters that may be their first language. I can start and then Jessica can jump in if she feels comfortable. Uh, that is an option and there's an additional charge. And why uh, we didn't include that was because based on the amount of responders and based on prior elections, uh, only 1% of our voters requested Spanish language ballots. So we can absolutely add that option. It's at council's discretion, just keeping in mind that likely would be one to maybe three Spanish language responders, which wouldn't necessarily statistically change the results of the survey. But of course, that's up to council's determination. Okay, thank you. Or I guess then what would be the additional cost? Oh, I'm so sorry, it's $2,000. Any other questions? We can go out to public comment on this item for anybody in-house. Not seeing anybody, we can take it back to council for deliberation. I can start, I'll just, um, I just wanna make the point that generally we, we I, well, I guess that would be a question. Um, this requires a two-thirds vote, correct? If um, if it were on the ballot, what kind of vote would it would would it need to pass on the ballot? So a measure F extension would be fifty percent plus one, uh, and the GO bond would be sixty six. Um, and the reason I bring that up is when we want more voters to come out to vote, we need to let them know about an upcoming election. And when I think about our bilingual speakers, our Spanish speakers in the community. This might be a way to engage them, to let them know. So even if we get one to three folks participating in the survey, it definitely triggers them to be interested in an upcoming election. Um, so I would be interested in adding that in just because it might actually help us later down the road with getting more people involved in, in voting. Um, so I would be happy to make a motion to approve the item um, as recommended recommended with the addition of the two thousand dollars for bilingual um, uh, surveys. Can I ask a question, or when is the time for that? Pardon? Is it time now to ask a question? Okay, yeah, I just wanted to ask. Um, I mean, if essentially the additional two thousand dollars is going to towards marketing for the potential um, ballot measures, are we allowed to 
spend money on marketing. So, like, I know I don't count. I'm not going to count this as, but like, yeah, in a roundabout way. That's what we're talking about, right? So, I'll give a sort of a city manager answer, and then I think you might want to hear from the city attorney. But in general, what we've done in the past is once an item is on the ballot, you're not you can't campaign for it as a city, but we can put out informational brochures. So we've done that in the past where we have a ballot initiative out there. We may just send something to residents saying, here's what the money would be used for and here's how much it would raise. So kind of informational, but the city Not can't campaign for it. Campaign. And so you said once it's on the ballot, what about before it's on the ballot? Are we allowed to sort of have a plan that we're going to put it on the ballot? Oh. No, we're not. Okay. You can't use public funds to campaign for a measure. Got it. Period. Okay. But, okay. So yeah, I guess this would this would fall into um, public information rather than campaign. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, the surveying certainly would, and then we've done. You know, we sort of have done like special editions of the newsletters to, mm -hmm. and you know, we'll always run it through legal to make sure that we're not delving into a campaign that it's right. really explaining um, what what the funds would be for. It's not uncommon if a city has a tax measure on the ballot, or certainly a bond measure, it's not uncommon for a city to publish um, like an information sheet that shows how the money would be used if the tax passes um, or if the bond passes. So it just that is different than, for instance, council members going door to door asking people to vote, or um, council members in saying on the dais, "We endorse this measure." That's different. What about off the dais? Sure, you, you get I, not on behalf of the council. Right, exactly, not on behalf of the council. Sure. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll second. <laughs> A first and a second, maybe a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. That'll take us to item 8, the 9B. This is our 2024 City Council meeting schedule. The recommended action is to adopt the resolution of establishing the regular meeting schedule for 2024. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This is the item that determines our, our Thursday nights for the next year. So just to give some brief background, as a reminder, regular meetings are typically held on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month, but that there are a couple of exceptions, notably July, August, November, and December. So last year, at the last meeting of 2022, the City Council approved a change to the 6 p.m. start time, which I think has been a successful change, and that is proposed to continue in 2024. The two options before you this evening both continue the same summer schedule that we followed this year. So one meeting in July and one in August on the fourth Thursday. But as a reminder, we are entering an election year. So that does kind of have an effect on the scheduling for November and December. So option A is pretty much the exact same as what we did this year. The second November meeting is held on Tuesday of Thanksgiving week. Um, so the pros of this schedule is that it maintains the status quo. The con is that there is a meeting during the holiday like we have today. Um, the next option we have before you this evening is the same summer schedule. The only thing that's revised is that the November meetings would be back to back, but it would stay on Thursday. The pro here is obviously we would not have to meet during a holiday week. The con is that there would be a short turnaround time for the November 21st agenda, which would really limit the amount of late additions. Like, for example, if something was added during the previous week's council meeting, staff would only have one day to turn it around and would probably have to publish the agenda with like a placeholder staff report rather than presenting a full staff report. So not impossible, but something to keep in mind. It is an election year, so I think staff would try to forecast the agenda in accordance with the election schedule. I don't think we would have results by that second November meeting, but that's something that would be coming up. With that, the recommended action is to adopt a resolution establishing the 2024 regular meeting schedule, selecting either option A or option B. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. We have questions. The staff have a preference is there any consensus on that 
So this was brought forward because some staff members, a lot of staff members are, you know, taking time off during the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, it's normal with a holiday to want to spend time with your family and loved ones. So staff did request this change um, and we thought we'd float it. We understand some of the council members might have plans Thanksgiving week too, so it might benefit you to not have a meeting that week, but we are open to your request or your preference. So staff generally favors option B. Yeah, I would say that's a fair assessment. Yeah, I, think so. I think some staff members do try to take some time off this week. Um, you know, I'm a curmudgeon. I usually don't. And, and, you know, I always think about it operationally just in terms of being able to produce good packets. It's hard to do it in back-to-back -back weeks. But I think that's definitely true that a fair number of staff members, as our community development director knows right now, who's on the East Coast, they do try to take time off um, this week. So I think it's either way. I think it's really kind of council's choice and what you prefer. I would say it's not impossible. We do have, during budget season, we have meetings back to back and we're able to produce packets. It would just be a really tight turnaround time and we might have to publish a placeholder if something was added last minute, but it's not an impossible task. Great. Any other questions? Any public comment? Seeing none. Any staff members? No, just kidding. Um, anyways, coming back to council deliberation. I would be open to you either. I'll make a motion to move forward with uh, option. What is it? Let me see. Hold on. I'm looking at the dates, so I'm trying to make sure I'm saying the right one. Option B with the back-to-back -back meetings that allows the entire thanks week of Thanksgiving to not have a council meeting, and I think that that would allow more flexibility for staff and council. Um, and if it, you know, turns out that there's an urgent issue, then we'll address it then, and hopefully there won't be. I'll second. First. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just haven't. We have a first and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. It's almost a holiday. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. I passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll see how that goes. So then we'll go back. We'll jump back up to um, consent item 8D. So still on the topic of holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> so uh, this was an error inadvertently when preparing this resolution. I prepared the resolution with a list of um, holiday and city hall closure dates without realizing that July 5th, so July 4th for 2024 falls on a Thursday this year. And when preparing the resolution, I included that Friday. Um, it was inadvertent, but I think I was manifesting subconsciously. <laughs> <laughs> and so unfortunately, when something like this happens, um, July 5th is not included on the city's like MOUs for employees as a designated city holiday. However, the city council could designate it as a city hall closure. So the distinction here is that it's not a paid holiday for employees, but employees can use PTO and City Hall would remain closed, so no one is required to be staffing City Hall. This year, I don't remember exactly what day the 4th fell on. I think it was a Wednesday this year, and there was very little traffic, or maybe it was a Tuesday. There's like very little traffic on that Monday before the holiday, and there were a lot of staff members who took time off to have um, enjoy the holiday with family members. And so staff did not see any increased traffic at City Hall. If the council were to designate this a closure, it would just mean that City Hall would be closed on that Friday following the 4th of July. So with that, the recommended action is to either adopt the resolution with the proposed change that July 5th would be a holiday closure or staff can amend the resolution and remove it and City Hall would remain open on that Friday. I'm available for any questions. Good, I have one. Great. Um, so you said that it wouldn't uh, staff could use PTO and City Hall would be closed, but if any staff decides they don't want to use PTO, would they still come in to work and just City Hall would be closed or would they would it be a mandatory vacation day essentially? So City Hall would be open to staff members. Okay, so they could still come in and do work if they yeah. wanted to. If they didn't, they can take the day off, but regardless, City Hall is closed to the public. Yeah, when we have these funny days where we have like a big holiday on a, or a Thursday, often what happens is Fridays are like, first off, we end up trying to work with our department head team, like who's going to cover it? You know, someone has to be there to answer phones, someone has to be there to open the door, someone has to be able to answer a planning question, a building question, a finance question. So 
it's always a little bit of a balancing act to make sure we have like a skeleton crew that can cover it. Um, and often those days are incredibly quiet. Like the phone doesn't ring and nobody shows up. So we were just thinking, well, you know, it is during our summer break and this would give us the ability to just say, we don't need to worry about overall coverage at City Hall because City Hall will be closed. And if people want to be off, if everyone wants to be off, that's fine. And if people do want to work, they can do that as well. So council's open to it. Uh, we haven't tried it before, but we've definitely, I've definitely seen those days over the years, like when January 2nd, for example, or sorry, January 1st is on a Tuesday or something or a Thursday. That next day is super quiet. Any other questions on that? I'm just, so City Hall will technically be closed to the public, but open for staff. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so we're just not worried about basically having every department represented to be able to answer any question that would walk in the door. Public comment? Seeing none, I'll take it back. Take it back. Move to approve the staff recommendation. I'll second that. Great. First and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Passes unanimously. And that then takes us down to item 10, which is adjournment. Um, again, I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Be safe. Spend time with your loved ones. And thanks for being here. All right. Good night.